good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're watching from. Thank you so much for joining us in a time of celebration of music and word. I hope that you all will enjoy as we do this together. Let's go.
for my sake and for your sake. And there's no other way to live life than to follow Jesus. He's seen the end from the beginning. He knows your life. In fact, his plans are better than anything that you could plan for yourself. Yeah. And so right now, we just want to say, Jesus, you're the one I follow. I don't want to follow my instincts. You're the one I follow. And so if there's anything that's holding you back from letting it go and saying, Jesus, you're the one I follow, you can lay it down. Jesus, you're the one we follow. Thought that I could do it. Thought that I could make it. Thought that I could build it on my own. But I've come to see that as I've tried to fill the void, nothing else can fill the hole. Feel full.
and it's not because we understand the whole picture but we know that you are a good good father and so we choose to put our trust in you oh god so be magnified in all situations be glorified in the good and the bad times and it's in the name of jesus we have just worshiped and the people of god say Wow, we're so glad that you're worshipping with us today. We're getting into a time that we love at Mavuno, and that's our time to give. And, uh, you know, I want to read for us from the book of Genesis, chapter 4. I'm going to read just uh, two or three verses from verse 3. It says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor, so Cain was very angry and his face downcast. I'm one of those people who grew up going to Sunday school, and so I, I know this story well. And I used to struggle with it because I used to feel like God was unfair uh, because, you know, he, he accepted the offering that, that, that Abel brought, which was, you know, meat, it was flesh. Uh, you know, that, that's what he had, what, that's what Abel came and presented. And I struggled with the fact that I thought that Cain's offering was rejected because it was plant. He was a farmer. Uh, while Abel was a, a livestock farmer. Uh, but then a close reading of this scripture helped me understand that actually there's a reason their offerings were not the same. It says that Cain brought some of, 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 of his produce, the produce of the land. But it says that Abel brought, a little more, was, uh, brought something a little more specific. It says he brought the fat portions. And what that represents is, is, is he brought the best of the animals. But secondly, he says, it says he brought the fat portions of the fast bones. In other words, Abel thought through his offering, he thought through uh, his sacrifice, and he gave a genuine, it was a sacrificial gift. It wasn't just what was left over, it wasn't just some of, of his produce. It was actually the best of his produce that he took a portion of and he brought before the Lord. And so our invitation to you uh, is that you will be like Abel. You will offer a gift that is from, from, from a place uh, of just a willingness to worship God with your sacrifice, a willingness to give even sacrificially that God may be glorified. It's part of how we worship God by bringing our gifts into the Lord's house. So the details for how you can, okay, you can give are on your screen, and I pray that God will give you the grace to be like able, not just to bring some, what was available or what was left over, but to select the best from the best of what God has blessed you with and to give a part of it as you acknowledge that actually everything was from God to begin with. Let me pray for us even as we give our Lord and our King. We thank you for the privilege of worshipping you through our giving. I pray for just open heavens over every person who's giving right now. I pray for the the. the just, you know, understanding that we give not because you need us to give, but because there are things you accomplish in us as we give. But secondly, I thank you because I know that every promise connected to our giving will be fulfilled even as we have given today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you and thank you for giving.
Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is, wherever you're watching us from. Uh, welcome to Mavuno Church. I'm so glad that you're able uh, to join us for our worship experience today. I'm Pastor James Mushai. I have the privilege of serving as one of the pastors within the Mavuno Church family under the leadership of our senior pastors, Pastor Karen, Pastor Moridi Wanjao, uh, who are the incredible spiritual parents that God has appointed over us as a church family. I have the privilege this month of bringing to you God's word uh, as we go through our sermon series that we're calling X Factor, Superpower Your Life. X Factor, Superpower Your Life. And I want to start us off uh, you know, with one of my favorite stories in the scriptures. I really, really love this story. It's recorded in the book of 2 Kings chapter 8. And I'm going to read for us from the, uh, uh, from the New Living Translation. 2 Kings chapter 8 from verse 8 to 12, just uh, uh, five verses. Here's what it says. When the king of Aram was at war with Israel, he would confer with his officers and say, we will mobilize our forces at such and such a place. But immediately, Elisha, the man of God, would warn the king of Israel, do not, do not go near that place, for the Arameans are planning to mobilize their troops there. So the king of Israel would send word to the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king so that he would be so that so that he would be on the alert there the king of aram became very upset over this he called his officers together and demanded which of you is the traitor who has been informing the king of israel of my plans it is not us my lord the king one of the officers replied elisha the prophet in israel tells the king of israel even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom what a powerful story. I, I really love this story. I find it so entertaining. You know, the king of Aram had a serious problem on his hands. He had a leak in his national security, national intelligence apparatus. And this was made clear by the fact that time after time after time, you know, he would make plans, war plans to go and attack the nation of Israel. And, and the outcome would make it clear that the Israelites knew ahead of time what he was planning and what he was scheming. And they were able to consistently avoid, uh, you know, the Aramean army and therefore avoid defeat. What he did not know was that there was a man in Israel who somehow had the capacity to acquire even the most closely guarded national security secrets, uh, you know, of, the, of their neighbors, Aram or Syria, uh, which is another name uh, for this nation that is here called Aram. You know, fortunately for his closest advisors, when he comes, you know, heads are about to roll, he's about to execute some people. He's like, someone is selling me out. But fortunately for them, one of them had some information. They knew that there was, uh, you know, he knew about the presence of this man, Elisha the prophet. And, 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 and so when the king confronted them, he says to him, listen, it's not just the war plans we are making. He says, even the things you say in your bedroom, that no one is there, it's just you and your wife or wives. I don't know how that worked. Whatever it is, even those stories, imagine this guy knows. He, he, he hears everything you say, even in the privacy of your bedroom. What a remarkable and entertaining story. I find it very, very hilarious. Over and over again in the Bible, we are confronted with the reality that God makes it possible. God allows men and women to carry a certain quality, a certain ability that makes it possible for them to operate in the supernatural. They seem to possess a certain X factor, something that enables them to superpower their life. These men and women live lives that are clearly marked by supernatural abilities. They are able to acquire knowledge supernaturally, like in the example of Elisha, the prophet. They are able to heal conditions that prove impossible for medicine to heal. They are able to, they even have the capacity to bring back to life people who have already died. How is that even possible? That's what we're talking about this month as we go through this sermon series, X Factor, Superpower your life. You know, this year we've been going through an exciting experience as the entire Mavuno family. We've been reading, you know, in January we started reading through the New Testament and we're using a reading plan by the Bible Project that will make it possible for us to read through the entire New Testament in the course of the year. And right now we've just come out of a dramatic, amazing, incredible, fun to read book called The Acts of the Apostles 
or Acts in short. It's the fifth book. The first four books are the Gospels. They record the life of Jesus on earth. And after this, we got into the book of Acts. And it's the perfect place for lessons to look, uh, for us to look for lessons regarding the X factor because it's packed with story after story after story of incredible manifestations of this X factor. Incredible stories of, you know, supernatural outcomes, supernatural interactions, uh, uh, you know, are recorded over and over and over in the book of Acts. And last week we read from Acts chapter 8. We saw that Philip, a leader in the early church in Jerusalem, uh, you know, when persecution came in Jerusalem, he found himself in a city of, in the city of Samaria and, 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 and he clearly possessed this X factor. Because of the many supernatural things he was able to do in the city of Samaria, the Bible tells us the city was filled with great joy. It says there was great joy in that city because of Philip and because of the things he was able to do. In other words, the disposition of that city was changed because of the entrance of one man, one man who possessed the X factor. And the two questions we answered last week were these. What is the X factor? And we found that actually the right way to ask that question is who is the X factor? Because the X factor is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is God who comes and empowers us and makes it possible for us to live in the supernatural. The second question we answered was this, who qualifies for the X factor? Who qualifies to receive this, this infilling of the Holy Spirit when the Spirit comes upon you and you receive power and a capacity to do even impossible things? Who is qualified for that? We learned that while many Christians believe that the X factor is for certain people, normally people with, an, with a formal title and an official ministry role and an upfront ministry assignment, like what I'm doing right now as I teach from God's word. Many people believe that this is the kind of person who qualifies for the X factor. But what we learned is that that belief is faulty, that actually the anointing is available for every believer, not just to those in upfront ministry. The anointing is available to every believer, not just to those in upfront ministry. In case you missed it, you can catch that first message uh, on our YouTube page, uh, Mavuno Church ORG. We'll continue reading from right where we left off in the book of Acts chapter 8. We're going to read from verse 9 to verse 13. The story of, of you know, Philip uh, in Samaria, it's sort of continuing uh, from where we had left off last week. Here's what it says. A man named Simon had been a sorcerer there for many years, amazing the people of Samaria and claiming to be someone great. Everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. They listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded them with his magic. But now the people believed Philip's message of good news concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. As a result, many men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself believed and was baptized. He began following Philip wherever he went and he was amazed by the signs and great miracles Philip performed. Many people in Samaria received and believed in the gospel that, that Philip preached. This message that Jesus, the Messiah, had died on the cross, was raised back to life so that we can be forgiven for our sins. Many people believed that message and became followers of Jesus. But the story singles out a specific individual in the city of Samaria who was one of those, you know, a resident of Samaria, a man named Simon who also became a follower of Jesus. And I want to highlight from this story a specific reality that the city of Samaria had known supernatural power even before the arrival of Philip. That's what this portion of scripture shows me. This power was observed through the life of this man, Simon, or to be more specific, Simon the sorcerer. In verse 10, it says that everyone from the least to the greatest often spoke of him as the great one, the power of God. Everyone in the city, from the least to the greatest, from, you know, young and old alike, every citizen of Samaria knew they had had the stories about Simon. They had seen him maybe do amazing, you know, magical things, supernatural things. And they were all convinced that he was incredible. The titles that they gave him are the best illustration that clearly this man walked in some serious power. They call him the great one. They call him the power of God. I want you to pause on that for a moment and just think about it. What kind of power do you need to demonstrate in order for people to say you're the, you, you know, you're the impersonation of the power of God? That's the name they gave him. 
What kind of power do you need to demonstrate in order for people to have a testimony, an entire city to testify that you are the great one? That's what they were calling Simon. And I see clearly that Simon was a powerful man. We're going to be answering a critical question in this message today. But before we answer that question, I want to draw out some lessons that I see in this, in this scripture that we have read. And the first lesson is this, counterfeit power is real power. Counterfeit power is real power. We said that last, last week we said that everyone qualifies for the X factor. We all qualify to receive the Holy Spirit. We all qualify, uh, uh, you know, every follower of Jesus qualifies to be empowered by the Spirit of God, qualifies to be anointed, to be a carrier of the presence of God and therefore the power that comes with having the Holy Spirit in our lives. But it is clear in this story that Simon was exercising power long before he became a follower of Jesus. He had not received the X factor yet, but he was already exercising power. And this makes clear to us that there are men and women who exercise supernatural power, but not on account of the Holy Spirit. They operate and they exercise supernatural power, but not because they have the Holy Spirit in their life. In Simon's case, the source of the power is clearly identified. It says he astounded the people of Samaria with his magic. He was a sorcerer. He was a witch doctor. Maybe that's how we would put it in this part of the world. So the first lesson I see is that counterfeit power is real power. Simon wasn't pretending. Everybody had a testimony that here is a powerful man who does supernatural things. But the second thing I see is this, that counterfeit power does not result in genuine blessing. Counterfeit power does not result in genuine blessing. Here's a powerful truth that we can find in these few verses. When Philip arrived in Samaria, when Philip did ministry in Samaria, the power that was operating and at work in Philip's life resulted in this powerful statement. There was great joy in that city. That was the outcome of, 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 of Philip's presence in Samaria. The manifestations of the X factor translated into joy for the residents of, this, of the city. Let me tell you what I see implied in that statement. Implied in that statement is this, that up until the arrival of Philip, the city was mostly sorrowful. That's why their joy is highlighted as an outcome of his visit. The thing that was most missing, the thing that was lacking, is the thing that, that has now become present or apparent, is the thing that is recorded. And so for me, the implication I see in that verse is that the city operated in gloom and sorrow until Philip entered and all of a sudden there was a breaking out of joy in the city of Samaria. Over the years, you must believe that Simon had demonstrated his power to the point that he had convinced people to call him the power of God. People were calling him the great one. But while his demonstrations had resulted in personal fame for him, Probably they had resulted in wealth for him as well because he was honored, respected, even deeply feared, most likely because his power was obvious. Not a single one of the things he did had translated into joy for the city of Samaria. I don't know what the demonstrations were. The Bible doesn't tell us, but the reality is they did not translate into joy. Only when Philip entered the city of Samaria was there a breaking out of joy in the city. So counterfeit power exists and it is real power and it manifests in visible, tangible ways. Simon clearly possessed and demonstrated it, but it never translates into genuine blessing. This is where people get it wrong because you want to go to, 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 to look for someone who operates in some village somewhere because you've been told they will accelerate your business, they will restore your marriage, there's a power they operate in. And many people have a testimony of that power, but the reality is, uh, this counterfeit power will never ever translate into genuine blessing. We can see that from the life of Simon. Counterfeit power exists, but it does not lead to joy. The outcomes it produces can never be uh, a genuine blessing. There will always be some sorrow that comes with whatever we receive from counterfeit power. But the third thing that I want you to see that I see in this story is this, and, and this is exciting and I love this, this is awesome. God's power is greater. God's power is greater than every kind of counterfeit power. You see, the Bible tells us that Simon followed Philip everywhere he went. Simon, the powerful man, the one who was called the great one and the power of God, Simon, Philip enters the city and even Simon is like, oh my goodness, I need to see what this man is doing. 
because the power of God that was at work in Philip and through Philip's life was clearly greater even to Simon himself. It was clear that this man carried a power that was greater than anything that he had possessed or anything that he had had up until that moment. The power of God far exceeds and outweighs any kind of counterfeit power. It might be real, but it does not come close to what the power of God is and what the power of God can accomplish. We are calling this power, uh, the source of this power, we are calling him the X factor, the Holy Spirit. When, people, when men and women are empowered by other forces, other spiritual forces in the kingdom of, of darkness, sorcerers, witches, witch doctors, that power is real. But the power that comes from the Holy Spirit, the X factor, as we are calling him, is always far greater. Listen. In verse 11, this is what it says about, about Simon. It says that they listened closely to him because for a long time he had astounded him. He had astounded them with magic. But listen to what it says about Philip when he came into Samaria in verse 6. It says, the crowds listened intently to Philip. There was a power that was present in Samaria and everyone listened to Simon because of that power. They followed him. He astounded them with his magic. But Philip entered and he says they listened intently to Philip. Even Simon himself came to follow Philip and to hear what he was teaching because the power of God is greater. Maybe you're watching this and you need to hear this. The power of God in your life will give you victory over every attack of the enemy because the power of God is always greater. But having learned those, those, those lessons, there, there's a critical question that I desire for us to answer today. And the question is this, how do we identify the X factor? What is the true measure of the X factor? How do we know if there can be power from God on account of the presence of the Holy Spirit, but there can also be power on the, you know, from the kingdom of darkness? How do we know? How do we know whether we are seeing a Simon or a Philip? How do we identify? How do we tell apart when there are demonstrations of power. The critical truth that, that every believer must understand is that counterfeit power exists, but it never results in blessing. Many times we are pursuing power. We are pursuing men and women who operate in power. Sometimes we pursue it because we are in desperate need of an in intervention in a situation that is impossible in our lives. Many times people are pursuing it because we are curious. We've heard about the supernatural and we are eager. We are wondering how does that work? And we want to have those kinds of experiences. We want to know what more could be available to us. In our pursuit of power and powerful intervention in our lives, one of the greatest risks we run is of falling prey to men and women who exercise counterfeit power. And then we believe that their power is as a result or a demonstration of the X factor. We could be looking at Simons and thinking these are Philips who God has sent to bless us. Simon exercised real power, but it did not come from God. Many people, including believers, have been fooled into doing all kinds of things by people who exercise counterfeit power. In the last few months, you know, here in Kenya, we have been rocked by the discovery of more than a hundred, you know, you know, people who lost their lives following their instruction that they received from some cult leader. That they followed a man, they followed his instruction, and the outcome is they literally lost their lives and they were buried somewhere in some forest. It has been a deeply traumatic story for Kenya, but it was made possible by the fact that the leaders of this cult were able to convince people that they had the X factor. Genuine men and women were following this, this cult leader, they were obeying and responding to his instruction positively because they believed that the power they saw in him was from God, but it was clearly not because it did not result in blessing. Counterfeit power never translates into genuine blessing. So here was a leader whose power and authority came from the kingdom of darkness, but it was no less real. It was absolutely real. God is looking for people who will carry the X factor and demonstrate his true power. Those illustrations will translate into genuine blessing, genuine and lasting blessing for many. But there are many deceivers who somehow still exercise power, which is real. So how do we distinguish between the two? What is the true measure of the X factor in someone's life? How do we know whether the power is real or counterfeit? How do we know whether it is from the kingdom of God, an empowerment of the Holy Spirit, or whether it is from the kingdom of darkness? 
as we are interrogating the reality of the X Factor this month, even as we have said that the X Factor is available to every follower of Jesus, the critical truth we need to know is that men and women can, can exercise and demonstrate power and that power not be from God. So what is the true measure? I haven't answered the question yet. I need to have your attention. How do you know someone is full of the Holy Spirit? Can you presume it based on power? This scripture and the life of someone show, uh, Simon shows us that you cannot. But Jesus and the Apostle Paul have answered this question for us. We're going to read Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, and the beginning of verse 16. I won't read all of it. You can, you can look at it later. Here's what it says. Beware of false prophets who come disguised as harmless sheep, but are really vicious wolves. They are disguised as harmless sheep, but they are vicious wolves. You can identify them by their fruit. Jesus warned his followers that there would be false prophets. And his instruction was simple. Look at their fruit and you will know if they are from me. Look at their fruit and you will know whether they are following me. And he went on to illustrate that to say, listen, a good tree does not produce bad fruit and a bad tree does not produce good fruit. And therefore, just look at the fruit and the fruit will tell you whether they are coming from me. And the Apostle Paul went ahead and told us what the good fruit is. In the book of Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, the Apostle Paul says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is present in someone's life, you see the fruit of the Spirit. You see love. You see joy. You see self-control. If you're looking at a man or a woman operating in power, but you can see zero self-control when it comes to different uh, realities in their life, you need to question the source of that power. If you're not seeing love, if you're not seeing gentleness and kindness, then you need to not be convinced that they are full of the Spirit. You need to ask some questions about who they are because the fruit is pointing you in a different direction. What this means is this, that the true measure of the X factor is character, not power. I'm going to say that again. The true measure of the X factor is character, not power. The real marker that someone's life is ruled by the Holy Spirit is that they are exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. Because the true measure of the X factor is character, not power. Too often we are fooled and so we want to go to the person exhibiting the greatest power because we are convinced that's where the answer lies. That's where my miracle lies. That's where my answer to prayer lies. The reason I have not gotten the answer to my prayer is that the, the Mavuno uh, you know, location that I sit at every Sunday morning, the power is not enough. And so I'm drawn to a man or a woman out there because they seem to have more power. What you need to understand is the true measure of the X factor is not power, it's character. Too many men and women have followed men and women whose fruit clearly illustrates that these are not people who are obeying or aligned to the Spirit of God. They are, the fruit of the Spirit is clearly and demonstrably absent from their lives. And so whatever uh, you know, appearance or demonstration of power there is, we need to question it and to ask, is this person really from God and is this power really from God? Because the true measure of the X factor is character, not power. We're going to talk a little bit about power next, next week, but you need to understand that the primary pursuit of the Holy Spirit is to make you more and more like Christ. It is to bring out the fruit of the Spirit, which is the character of Jesus. The true measure of the X factor is character, not power. As we trust God for power, as we trust God to grow in the infilling of the Holy Spirit, we must be trusting God to teach us to yield and surrender more to the leading of the Holy Spirit so that we can honor him in every area of our lives. That we won't just grow in power without first growing in character because the true measure of the X factor is character, not power. Simon had power. Philip had power. But Philip was dramatically connected to God and the Holy Spirit was at work in his life. If you read the whole chapter, you find that the Holy Spirit at some point shuttles him supernaturally from one location to the other to perform the will of God. He's completely yielded to the Holy Spirit and to the leadership of his Lord Jesus. Simon had power as well, but he was completely disconnected from God. And what we need to do is look for the fruit because the true measure of the X factor is character, not power. I want to close for us with a word of prayer and I'm going to pray for two things. The first, that the Holy Spirit will transform you, will transform me 
and align us to God's will for our life. That God will teach us how to yield and surrender fully to his spirit so that he can make us who we need to be. But secondly, I will pray that my life will be clearly marked by the fruit of the spirit. That those around me will in increasing measure testify that they are seeing the fruit of the spirit. They are seeing love. They are seeing joy. They are seeing patience. They are seeing a goodness and kindness and all these things that the Apostle Paul speaks of, that in increasing measure they are seeing those things more and more in my life, which is the true demonstration of the Holy Spirit being in his rightful place in my life as a Jesus follower. Let us pray. Our Lord and our King, we thank you for your love and your goodness, King Jesus. We thank you because as you left, you said that you're leaving us a promise, the promise of the X factor, the Holy Spirit who will become our constant companion, who will fill us and empower us for the assignment that you have given us, our Lord and our King. We thank you for the privilege of being carriers of your presence. I pray, my Lord and my King, that you will transform myself, you will transform every person who's watching this right now, that you will teach us to yield and surrender our wills, our lives entirely to you. That as we surrender fully, as we yield fully, the Holy Spirit will, will shape and mold us and cause us to become everything that you desire us to be to the glory and honor of your name. I pray for myself, I pray for every person watching this, that increasingly, Lord, where there hasn't been patience, there will be a testimony from those around us that we are growing in patience. Where we have been unloving or unkind, that we are growing in, a, in, in demonstrating love, in demonstrating kindness. I pray that in every area of our lives, you will help us grow in the fruit of the Spirit, that we will grow in our nature, in our character. You will transform us uh, day by day, moment by moment, and cause us to become fully and entirely the children, the sons and the daughters that you desire us to be so that we can accomplish the great assignments that you have for us to the glory and to the honor of your name. As we go into the week ahead, I speak a blessing over your people, Lord. Would you go ahead of them? Would you do in their lives exceedingly, abundantly above everything that they can think, ask or even imagine in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week ahead and see you next week.